So today I am simply going to uh, turn the podium over to our uh, terrific speakers and um, let them have a go at some of the major questions around religion, ethics, and the presidential campaign. Um, our first speaker will be um, Professor Alan Wolf, who is uh, known to many, if not most of you, here in the room. He's the founding director of the Boise Center, as well as a professor of political science here at Boston College. His work focuses on religion and American public life, but also ranges widely. The author and editor of more than 20 books and a frequent contributor to the New York Times, Atlantic, and other newspapers and journals, he's among America's most prominent public intellectuals. His PhD is in political science from the University of Pennsylvania, and he's going to get us started with an overview of some important themes. Thanks for being here, Alan. It's such a pleasure to have Thank you. Thank you, and glad to see you all. Um, there's something a little strange, in a sense, that I have to begin with, and that is that over the course of the last couple of decades, We've had a series of panel discussions like this just before an election was about to be decided. And in all those cases, uh, who was going to win was the big open question that no one had to answer. But what that person would do after they won was pretty straightforward. They'd try to implement their program and so on. This one, it's the exact reverse. Uh, in spite of anything you may have heard, uh, Hillary Clinton is going to win. Uh, or if you don't like it that bold, uh, never at this point in an election since we've been keeping records has someone had such a substantial lead. Her lead has also been pretty consistent and has survived things like the Comey letter last week and, and, and so on. So, so I think we have a pretty good idea uh, of who's going to win. But what's going to happen afterwards is the much more interesting question. Uh, we've now uh, already heard the first shots in a war that the bloggers are calling uh, pro-peachment, which is impeachment before you even get into all this. That's one thing, you know, to try to impeach someone after with this. Uh, and uh, uh, some people are pretty depressed about this election. I'm one of them, but I'm depressed more about what I just see as endless cycles of recrimination. I don't know if there's a word called crimination, but crimination and recrimination going on uh, endlessly, and a real, what looks like to be a really serious crisis of legitimacy if uh, a duly elected president is unable uh, to make uh, a recommendation and have it successfully confirmed. Now, that would be a constitutional crisis. Um, and I have to say, in all my years of observing politics, constitutional crises or legitimation crises are things that happen in Europe and in the third world. They're not things that happened here uh, in the United States. Um, I'm struck by, in fact, as a political scientist, the number of once seemingly impermeable laws of how politics are supposed to operate have not been uh, visible uh, during this campaign. Uh, the first book I should have ever read as a, a young political scientist was a book called An Economic Theory of Democracy by a man named Anthony Downs. And it predicted with superb logic and wonderful diagrams that in every election, both candidates will soften their extreme positions and move toward the center because that's where the votes are. Well, you know, this has not been applicable for a while, but it's certainly not uh, applicable now when uh, one of the candidates is uh, uh, moved very, very far to the right, and the other, in order to respond to a surprisingly powerful challenge from Senator Sanders has been moved to what is now the most liberal Democratic Party platform uh, of our time. So we can throw that one out. Uh, another influential book that all of us political scientists studied carefully was by a political scientist named Walter Dean Burnham. And he developed what he called a theory of critical elections, that roughly every 32 years, the dynamics of party competition would change. So in 1932, we had a critical election, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president, uh, and the Democrats were pretty much the dominant party. Uh, then you could say, uh, um, and, and uh, depends on how you date these things, but maybe Eisenhower and Nixon looked like a shift toward the Republican Party. Uh, politics is still uncertain, but none of our elections have really been critical elections, because critical elections were supposed to send the United States off on a new course of policy. And our recent elections haven't been about policy. There, there are no mandates. Uh, there might be a mandate that 
somebody won, uh, but there's no particular mandate to pursue a, a, a particular set uh, of policies. And I think that's fairly visible uh, as well. A very distinguished political scientist named Lawrence Fiorina wrote a book which tried to argue that there was really no culture war in the United States. I happen to have written a very similar book. Uh, I can say that both of us are simply wrong. Um, I think my book, which came out in the 80s, was right for its time, um, but things have intensified so much now that culture war almost seems uh, like it should be replaced by Kulturkampf or something resoundingly heavier in, uh, in, in, in seriousness. Um, everyone who studies political scientists knows about the most current example, which is in an enormously influential book called The Party Decides, was published a few years back. And it demonstrated, again, very convincingly that parties really matter uh, and that who gets endorsements is very, very important and when they get their endorsements and so on. And uh, here we have a candidate uh, uh, capturing a party. Um, you just can't say it's the other way around, it seems to me. And, and because of that, uh, it is true that Republicans are, as we said, coming home to Trump, which is why the polls seem to be tightening. Uh, but there's going to be a, a major division in that party. Whether there will be a major division in the Democratic Party, um, there, the, the thesis that the party decides has been somewhat more confirmed because the insurgent candidate lost and the candidate would be backing up what you might call the party establishment one. So they, they got half of a right and half of it wrong. Um, all of our, if all of our political science theories are, are wrong and can't really explain what's been happening this year, it may be that we're, the, we're just the wrong academic discipline. Uh, to uh, uncover the real dynamics. Maybe we need another academic discipline. Over the last 30, 40 years, the major uh, challenger to political science and its explanations has come from the field of economics. But economics really isn't going to help us very much either. We've had all kinds of different theories about who's voting for Trump, and they range the scale from unemployed, angry people to quasi-successful people, and so on. No, no, the real discipline we need is psychology. Um, the uh, debate among psychologists is quite fascinating if you haven't been following it. Uh, the American Psychological Association adopted something called the Goldwater Rule, which was that psychologists shouldn't make pronouncements about the mental health of candidates if they're not their patients, if they're just reading newspapers and so on. And psychologists were, uh, you know, really sort of held to this rule that it's not their job uh, to declare uh, that one candidate has narcissistic rage. But the narcissistic rage on display uh, at every one of the debates and almost every speech and so on has been pretty obvious. And so a number of psychologists are now saying we have to get rid of the Goldwater rule and we are allowed to comment. And you know, for whatever it's worth, when I hear the psychologists talk about what motivates the Republican candidate, I learn more of them I do from when political science talk about cycles uh, and parties deciding and so on. So I'll leave it to my colleagues to continue the discussion. Thanks a lot, Alan. Uh, our next speaker is Maria Teresa Davila. She's an associate professor of Christian ethics at Andover Newton uh, Theological School. Uh, she's an important voice in the global Catholic Church, and her area of expertise is in public theology, Latina ethics racial justice, immigration, and the use of force. Um, I understand your book project is entitled Embodying the Option for the Poor, is that right? And uh, in which she seeks to develop the option for the poor for a US audience amidst cultural and ideological divisions. And we are proud to say that she's also a graduate of the PhD program in theological ethics here at Boston College. Welcome back, Nancy. Thank you. Um, just commenting to Eric earlier that I feel this is a cruel game of duck, duck, goose. <coughs> Um, being sitting here among um, such elite and, and well-known scholars speaking about something that I'm only entering into um, more recently. So um, bear with me. Uh, one of the things that, um, one of the questions in the synopsis for this event um, was, do we ask, is, is there an ethical candidate for president?
president of the United States, right? So on the, on the web page. Um, so do we ask that, is there an ethical candidate for president of the United States? Um, I'd like to ask more um, whether there is an ethically informed electorate for this election cycle. And I'm going to propose, and this is what I, I, I've been looking at more recently, that um, I think the, the, the electorate that would like to call itself people of faith, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, the evangelical wing, et cetera, has in fact um, had forces thrust upon them in the past 40 years. Ellen uh, referred to the culture wars. We can call them all sorts of names that uh, have done what I call, have stunted the, the development of social virtues, stunted the development of social virtues such that when the electorate is faced with an election, they seek guidance, or electorate of faith, right? Um, they seek guidance from their faith leaders who, um, by virtue of a, of a number of forces, not all, and, and I'd love Alan to speak a little bit more about this. We were speaking earlier about culture wars and whether they were religious in nature or not. Um, even though they seem religious, there's a lot of money thrown into them um, there are a lot about power and about the balance of power between different agendas in the United States and uh, people of faith, the electorate that calls itself people of faith in the U.S. pays the price because their, um, their leadership, and I'll speak about Catholics specifically uh, in a moment, orients them toward key issues that they need to look at for in each <coughs> election cycle. So the Catholic electorate after decades of morally crippling culture wars, was left completely adrift um, on what I call these non-negotiables. If you keep hearing, if you've heard before that word, um, completely adrift to face the kind of election cycle this turned out to be. So in the document that the United States Catholic Bishops Conference um, puts out every election cycle, forming consciences for faithful citizenship, um, essential elements of Catholic morality are discussed vis-a-vis -vis the public square and vis-a-vis -vis the election cycle and where to put our vote. And within that, there is a hierarchy of evils. Some people have called them non-negotiables. Uh, abortion is one example. Euthanasia is another example. Racism, another example, where um, you are not to support, you are not to vote, if, if, if you belong to the Catholic Church, for a candidate that su supports a particular policy if your goal in voting for that candidate is to support that platform as well. The document, in fact, has a lot of other really great text about what the Catholic tradition believes should be the public role of a person of faith in civic life, such as the development of solidarity for communities, um, being able to speak in the public square for marginal communities, for the needs of others, for uh, the common good and the development of the common good, for the development of peace, etc. And yet, the document up front and in the public, uh, as, as media picks it up, etc., and in the churches as well, comes across as very much establishing a hierarchy that says all of those social virtues, collaboration, imagination, solidarity, uh, cooperation, all those social virtues are secondary to these absolute rules um, against voting for someone whose platform in some way violates what, is, what are tenets of Catholic um, moral theology. And I think that that has been a disservice to the electorate um, because while offering clarity is important for leaders of different communities of faith, uh, in a sense, it doesn't present the full picture of what a person of faith is called to be in the public. And so now we get to an election cycle where people might be looking for those non-negotiables and saying, okay, who's the pro-life candidate? Wait, squinting at the candidates and saying, who, who has that label? And realizing that um, it, it's not as easy to figure that out. And that in fact, that they're, they're really lacking in some resources to analyze what it is that they can vote for uh, if they want to take their faith values seriously in, in their election. So, so barring this, we are confronted with two candidates 
for the dominant political from the dominant political parties in our nation that I personally think equally threaten the common good. And I know there's been a lot of talk about false equivalencies in um, in different analyses, ethical analysis of this election about saying you know it's a false equivalence to um, look at different email versions of email scandals with Hillary Clinton versus some of what uh, Donald Trump has said. Um, I, I don't, I, those might be false equivalences. I think there's other arenas in which there are real equivalencies of how they would harm, both candidates would harm the common good. And so my question would be, do we have the language and the tools in the public square to address those and to have intelligent conversations with each other across different ideological lines for that um, conversation? So rather than actually ask critical questions of both candidates with respect to key issues in Catholic social thought, such as care for families, the dignity of labor, the option for the poor, environmental justice, racism, and other topics, um, Catholics and other voters instructed for decades by the church to seek the very elusive so-called pro-life candidate um, are, are adrift. They're, they're really at a loss right now. Um, and I think that there's been a willful political myopia um, that has been brought up, again, by the culture wars, if you want to use that term, um, with regard to these social, social virtues and a social moral compass for the Christian electorate in the public square, and maybe perhaps other people of faith and other concerned citizens who are equally committed to the common good. So um, I, I want to just take my last few minutes to talk about a little bit about what is not being talked about. because. So as, as Eric uh, referenced, um, my interest is in uh, the concept of the preferential option for the poor and how that um, does or does not gain ground uh, among U.S. Christians. And um, one of the things that I know that, that is important to notice, and, and I know this, the, what I'm about to say is a, is a, is a, is a tool of, of political mechanisms. Uh, and we saw it a lot. I think Obama is the master of the following, and that is, um, either at debates or rallies, I spoke, I was sitting at a cafe with Karen from West Virginia and hearing about Karen's battle with her daughter's cancer and how her bills were blah, 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 blah. But Karen from West Virginia, or whoever, uh, it was Joe the Plumber for, for McCain, uh, Obama did, did this brilliantly in his campaign. Individual persons, uh, and their struggle were really important in el different election cycles. Have you heard anyone's name in this election cycle? No one. It is so personality driven that no one has been mentioned. And I think that's very worrisome. And it should be very worrisome for people of faith because it means that those stories aren't worth anything now in this campaign. I, I personally, that concerns me on both um, candidates. It concerns me that like the 2012 election where the Occupy movement had just finished, no candidate mentioned the Occupy, the concerns of the Occupy movement, even though it had been a national movement, even though it opened up the question of how do we discuss banking and loan lending, student lending, um, health uh, care debt, etc., the mortgage fraud, etc., um, it had opened up that conversation in the public. Neither candidate discussed it during the 2012 election. So now we have uh, an environmental crisis and the uh, protests at Standing Rock in North Dakota. And again, not a word among our candidates. Not one word about, the, and very few words about the environmental crisis. So I think that, that, that um, we have uh, Puerto Rico which is now um, from Puerto Rico, so this is very dear to my heart, um, which is having elections the same day for a governor, but it doesn't matter because it's under a, um, a board, a governing board that's set by the US as part of its restructuring of its debt. And so governance is coming, gonna come from this board, not from an elected government, which they hope to elect on Tuesday. Not a word of that um, from the candidates in the public. So I think there's, it's very worrisome um, that the U.S. Uh, Black Lives Matter the same way. It receives very, very, very little attention um, between these two candidates, but that there are clear movements, social movements in the U.S. 
for situations of justice and situations that lift up um, the plight of the marginalized um, in the United States that have not been mentioned by the candidates. Um, and so I think that people of faith should have something to say to that. Um, but again, if virtues such as solidarity, uh, collaboration, imagination, receive such a low play um, when it discuss, being discussed by people of faith and leaders of communities of faith that always put it as a high premium the non-negotiables uh, of the culture wars, then it's very difficult that we can have those discussions and that we can be prepared to have those discussions. Okay. Just initial Great, thoughts. yeah, thanks very much. Our final speaker is Professor Mark Landy, who's a professor of political science here at Boston College and faculty chair of the Irish Institute as well here at BC. His expertise is in American political systems and in particular the American presidency. And in addition to teaching uh, BC students, he regularly teaches public officials from Ireland and Northern Ireland about American politics through a series of executive programs uh, run by the Irish Institute. Um, he's published widely in the area of American politics and has uh, PhDs in government from Harvard. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, thanks, thanks for being here. Pleasure to be here. Um, I'll return, I am going to actually return to the, to the election in a narrow sense because there are really two questions uh, about this election that I think uh, are uh, worth asking. One is, how can religious conservatives support Trump? And why is Hillary so unpopular? And I would stipulate she was unpopular before Comey's revelation. She was unpopular even before a lot of this email stuff happens. So it's, it's, it's a worthy question. But I actually do want to also, surprisingly, even to myself, talk about religion. Uh, students in my classes know I love to tell the following anecdote about, the religi about religion and our parties. Uh, if you want to find a Republican on Sunday morning, go to church. If you want to find a Democrat, go to Starbucks. <laughs> and uh, that, as much as I love that metaphor, I, I, as I thought more about religion in, in this election, I think it's misleading. Uh, it's misleading. It's obvious that the party of church going among non-African Americans has to be stipulated African Americans have high levels of church attendance and they are Democrats. Uh, excluding African Americans and Latinos may be moving more into that category, that they've been a more mixed bag up till now, they may be moving into that category. Of, but but the um, uh, excluding uh, African Americans, Republicans are the party of church going. And the Democrats aren't. But I think that's an awfully narrow definition of religion. If we take a broader definition of religion that's not based on solely on monotheism, it seems to me we have to, rep we have to recognize the religious quality of a large segment of the Democratic Party, uh, particularly expressed by the Sandersites, but probably also the left wing of the Hillary um, uh, group. And that is. Perfectionism, which is a, a religious notion, that, that, that we can somehow on earth create the perfect society. This is, this, this is a matter of faith. There's no, there's no evidence for this. Um, and indeed, uh, the, the way in which uh, people, I think a lot of them who call themselves progressives, link perfectionism to public policy. And somehow, what the government does us outside of where we are, improve us in dramatic, dramatic ways. Um, I, I have to say, where's the evidence? Not all national public policies fail. There have been great successes. The Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, Medicare, I, 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 could list, I could list more. But you know, you think of all the public policy generation of the last 50 or 60 years. I think the notion that this is pushing in a direction of perfectionism is, is, is a matter of faith, not, not, uh, uh, not empiricism. Uh, okay, so two, two at least wings of both parties, highly religious. And of course, problem, religion has a very problematic relationship to partisan politics because both parties don't just serve religious ends, they serve mammon, both of them. Each party is tremendously protective of a set of economic interests that could never pass the, the 
religious test that's perhaps more obvious with the Republicans who are so protective of the, of the tax code, so protective of the, uh, the needs of the rich, the famous Romney uh, comment about the 47% uh, was a real tip-off of, of a huge part of what the Republicans are all about. Uh, but I, I'll give you a, another kind of startling statistic. More than half of the delegates to the Democratic Party convention work for the government. The Democrats are the party of government. And in this case, not the party of the needy people who want things from, need things from government, but the party of the suppliers, the suppliers of, of government. So, um, you know, to simplify, the Republicans are the party of the rich, the Democrats are the party of government that, that really works against more uh, exalted religious understanding uh, of what uh, of what party politics is like, but the two somehow rest uneasily together, and we see it uh, uh, we, we see it in this election. Uh, I won't get to Trump yet because he's not such a problem to talk about. So let's take Ted Cruz. Would Ted Cruz really have led a great religious revival? Do you really believe that? would be equally s somehow suspicious. His wife is a big shot for Goldman Sachs. Even in the same couple, you see the kind of dynamic uh, at work. Uh, would Hillary really lead us toward the earthly paradise that, that uh, I think the Sandersite progressives in particular seek? Or would, or would she have to run that by the trial lawyers? Um, okay. So, um, in terms of Religion, um, you know, on the whole, right? We've seen the ascendancy of progressivism over the decades. You know, there's been some retrenchments under Reagan, under, under W. Bush, not much under W. Bush, but really, uh, the progressives have been in the ascendancy, and that's really distorted the religion of the of the right, right? because it's turned them into purely, I shouldn't say purely, but overwhelmingly, the the the, the, the apostles of resentment. Listen to, to the content of so much of what the uh, uh, religious right talks about politically. It's what we've got to change, what we've got to do away with, and those nasty bastards who've done it to us. Everything's been done to us. Right? <coughs> uh, we're killing babies. We're, we're, uh, we, we've, we've ruined the institution of marriage, uh, and on and on. And this has left, I think. Just right in a very desiccated uh, uh, kind of kind of posture, um, and uh, but on the other hand, and, and then that seems to me overwhelmingly explains the the answer to my first question: How can religious conservatives support Trump? Because they're damn mad, and so is he. And the his, his whatever his other tremendous failed his capacity. Late rage. That's what the other Republican candidate didn't do. They, they share a certain amount of the agenda of the religious right. They're, they're, they're conservatives uh, in their own right, but they couldn't channel that rage and be corrupt. And if rage becomes the dominant sentiment, then of course you're looking for uh, someone who can express it. And who you can at least kid yourself will actually do something about it. I think that is a bit. A lot of self delusion in this um, Regardless of his own godlessness, which is palpable, the stance is almost entirely negative. Uh, he's going to Ameri make America great by moving America backward. But, but what a show of, the show of strength is really a show of titanic rage. Um, and so, why, on your side, why isn't Hillary more popular? You know, she Alan says she's going to win. I hope so. I think yeah, if I was a betting man, which I sort of am, I would probably bet on her. But I don't think it's nearly as lead pipe as, as you do. But I think it's likely. Um, so why is she so unpopular? I, I don't. You know, people <coughs> say unpleasant things about her personality and her fashion statements. I think this is all beside the point. I think I think 
what we're seeing is that among vast, all middle of the electorate that is not religiously progressive, there's tremendous skepticism about progressivism, tremendous skepticism about whether or not problems are solvable via the national government. The great example of this, of course, is Obamacare, which has now been in, in place right, since roughly 2009. It's still unpopular. It still scores badly in the polls. So that, that the, the progressive faith that imbues, say, Sandersites, but I would say it influences the whole Democratic Party and it can pay attention to the platform, is likely to do so even more in the future. Both parties have, have crises on their hands. Um, we're really looking at a situation where the party of, of a more uh, ordinary meaning of religion and a party of a less ordinary meaning of religion are both in crisis. All right, thank you very much. Let me put up a few. There's the reference a few uh, polls, and I have a little bit of info from it, it is interesting how uh, the media has changed our, uh, our notion of how to look at polls by now we have percentage chance of victory as opposed to uh, polling numbers nationally. And I'm curious, that we have two political scientists, I think that would be interesting for you to talk about. But one chart that you see here is a series of uh, closing the gap over and over again. This is Nate Silver's outfit uh, giving us this prediction based on multiple local polls, right? Uh, you see the numbers for um, based on electoral votes at the top, the projected electoral votes for each candidate, and then the, the projected popular vote, which is what we used to see uh, in the build-up to elections, is much tighter, right? Um, and um, but this is one that I thought might be the audience might might find worthwhile lingering on while we're discussing other things as well. I'm not going to go through it, but this is from uh, Public Religion Research Institute. It's a recent poll through mid-October, and um, what you'll see, uh, it's a little hard to see, maybe it's easier from straight, straight, straight back that way, but you'll see the second uh, uh, line there from the top, white evangelical Protestants are expressing that they will vote for Trump 66% uh, to 17%, whereas you look at black Protestants, uh, that number is 90% for Hillary Clinton and 3%, and Hispanic Catholics 84%, uh, whereas white Catholics are split down the middle. You see it's a very strong racial divides. Uh, on this election as well. And that's uh, another thing that I think should be on the table as we, as from the audience or from here as well, um, uh, that question. And one other uh, item I don't think I have a, a chart to mention, but I'd love to hear the, the panelists speak about is the sort of uh, uh, populist connection between Trump and Sanders. Um, we, um, it's frequently said that American political candidates are all clustered around a tiny dot in the middle, uh, that they're not as far apart as, as we think they are. Um, and yet we have some real examples this, this uh, campaign season of, of some pretty strong differences. Um, and uh, we also see two candidates that had a major impact uh, with a strong appeal to populism of different sorts. Um, so if any of you would like to pick up any of those, and you can respond to others as well. And then we'll turn to the audience. We want to make sure we have lots of conversations and Q&A with the audience. Well, the only, I'm going to respond to a couple of things. Uh, uh, I, I had more time. I, I would have gone into more uh, the, uh, well, it, it, it's in a sense a response to Mark's question. Mark's question is, why do religious conservatives support Trump? And the answer is they, they, they share rage against the system. My answer would be slightly different, although I think in line with yours, and that, why do religious conservatives support Trump? Because they're not religious. Uh, I think this election has proven that the so-called Christian right and the so-called religious right has always been much more about power than it's been about grace. Um, it, 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 you can't, I'm sorry, you can't support Trump if you have certain fundamental religious notions uh, you know, that, that go back to Jesus and the good works he did or in the Jewish tradition, the comparable sort of things. I mean, uh, I think there are genuinely religious conservatives in the United States, but they're the ones who aren't endorsed to Trump. The most prominent example is probably the most important uh, in the uh, uh, evangelical movement in the United States, and that's Russell Moore, who heads the uh, Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern 
Baptist Convention, which is our largest evangelical religious denomination. He succeeded a man named Richard Land, who was the very embodiment of a culture warrior, and uh, um, Russell Moore, who I'm proud to say, uh, gave the uh, prophetic voices of the church lecture uh, under the Boston um, uh, Center's uh, auspices, what was it, two or three? Yeah, three years, three years ago. ago. We yeah. sort of found, uh, now he's being written about uh, in, in a lot of ways. He's a genuinely religious man and leads a genuinely religious movement. And he's doing what evangelicals pretty much always did uh, until uh, the 1970s, which is they build churches, they, they plant churches, they, they fund their colleges and universities, they expand as evangelicals are called upon God to do their following, but they don't get in, in political campaigns like this. So one thing I'm pretty sure about is that people on the order of uh, um, Falwell Jr., Jerry Falwell Jr., and uh, uh, Sarah Huckabee, and uh, uh, you know the names. I'm just having one of those moments. Uh, those uh, conservative Christian leaders that are going out, Tony Perkins, uh, the family research guy, uh, they're, they're, they're going to lose their credibility. Uh, even within their own movements. Uh, because it does seem to me that most of the evangelicals that I've gotten to know in the course of, of my research thought it might be worth a chance to get involved in politics. I mean, these were people who thought that abortion was murder. These are people who thought that we've driven religion out of our public life by Supreme Court decisions and, and so on. And they're genuinely <coughs> moved by what they perceive as the immorality of their society. So in the aftermath of Roe v. Wade, I think they said, look, we've always been warned against politics. Politics is not the way of the Christian, uh, but let's try it. You know, the society is really corrupt. So let's try it. Well, they're going about as far as they can go. Uh, you talk about selling your soul to the devil. Selling your soul to Trump is worse. Trump is worse than Memphis. That's a I guarantee you. So I think that's a big part uh, of what's going on that I, I wanted to emphasize a little bit earlier. One last thing. We've See, been colleagues. We're, 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 we've been colleagues forever. Don't take this wrong. Hillary Clinton is unpopular because she's a woman. <laughs> okay, so the second point, I just say no. The first point, you know, I was worried Alan and I got to. to 40 minutes without a disagreement. He gave this, this talk, I agree with everything he said, except about giving the psychologist. Yeah. <laughs> everything else was entirely on the money. So what we have to do, because Alan, I think, in a way, shifted his, his he, he said something very bombastic at the beginning, and he modified it. So I'm going to go for the bombastic. Statement. What we have to do is separate out the, the Christian right grassroots and the Christian right leadership. The Christian right leadership, I think, is very prone to corruption. I can give you a nickel uh, 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 for any of those people. But I, I, I have actually on my, not on my side of the family, because we're Jews, but on the other side, I actually have evangelical Christians. I, 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 go, I go to evangelical Christian churches. The ordinary rank and file evangelical Christian is a very serious Christian by any decent standard, even though, you know, you can disagree with them on issue, but they are for real, and they are godly, and they go and, and work in, when Katrina happened, they, they went in droves to, um, uh, to help the people of New Orleans, uh, I, I, the church that I go to in Florida when I'm down there is integrated, it has a significant, not, not a huge, but, it's, but a meaningful black uh, uh, participation, so I, I I, I insist on the godliness of people whose politics I, I might very, I think very much disagree with. I would have to say, among Catholics, that I, I would agree with that as well. Um, you know, the conversations that I have and in and social media fora that I moderate, um, that get very contentious of people speaking from a very deep center of faith <coughs> on one side of an issue or another, <clears throat> when the when the discussion gets way down a rabbit hole, um, one of the ways I interrupt it as a moderator is to ask, what is at stake? You know, what is at stake for you? 
to, to land on the right side of the abortion question. And what is at stake for you to land on the right side of social assistance or whatever? And uh, I get the answer, my soul. Um, so for, for, for a lot of these people that I'm engaging with in social media, um, it, it is about the, 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 the eternal, I mean, they see it in terms of their, their eternal fate and the eternal fate of those in a nation that they see as ungodly in X or Y issues. Um, so I was at Brown University two weeks ago talking on the election. Um, uh, it was a Catholic lecture, and one of the, um, you know, one of the the, the persons who was a, uh, graduated from Brown and is now on the staff, uh, you know, brought up the language of not, not of culture wars, but she said, "What well?" Because I was speaking a, a, about how to mediate within the culture wars, um, how to mediate for moderation or how to mediate. For, you know, toward solidarity, and she said, but what about the real war um, that's happening for our souls? And so this is, you know, someone <coughs> who has an Ivy League education for whom this is a very real um, issue. So I don't, I don't want to discount the, the faithfulness of the rank and file, and I, and I think that that, um, one of the things I wanted, I, I, I was clear that I wanted to leave them with, um, well, I, I did this at Merrimack last week as well, but at Brown was, there's a lot of money behind these battles. It's, it, for you, you say what's at stake for you is your soul. But like Alan says, for some, it's a lot of power and a lot of money. Billions and billions of dollars that are put on, say, uh, uh, voter initiatives on the ballots, um, as we're seeing in Massachusetts. The voter initiatives um, and, the, and the questions on transgender bathroom uh, issues, like in North Carolina and Massachusetts, lots of money being put into that at, at a certain level that then plays around with the faith life of those that are, at, that are on another level. So it's, it's a really complex uh, process that um, is, is important to, to understand and try to navigate. Let's take questions from the audience or comments. Uh, I think we have a few microphones to use. Everyone up here, here. Uh, Kyle, why don't you get us started? Um, I think I can speak loudly enough. I, the record. Well, let's, yeah. Okay. Loud into the microphone. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Um, so I just want to contend to Alan's point about uh, why people dislike Hillary, um, and also I forget who said it, um, but I think that you know people dislike her because she's moved more to the left and people in the center are skeptical of her. I know many more far left people who are extremely skeptical of Hillary, and the major problem that I hear from them is her hawkishness um, and her foreign policy. So I'm just curious. I mean, I don't disagree that the fact that she's a woman plays a large role, but I think her hawkishness also plays a major, major role for many of these people on the left. She's moved on that, too. Um, she's not in favor of an intervention with troops and the Middle East the way she, I think, would have easily been in her earlier incantation. That may be that she understands that the Democrat Party has shifted more towards Sanders' position, but it may be <coughs> she learned something. It may be that constant interventions in third world countries, she learned, isn't effective. We've tried it over and over and over again. Uh, I'm sure, you, well, you know people to your left and therefore much to my left. Uh, better than I do. I'm sure there's residual anger. People are still angry at Bill Clinton for the welfare reform um, and uh, triangulation, which is a term in use at the time when he sort of tried to play Republicans in Congress off against Democrats. And, and a, lot of, a lot of the Democratic Party was uh, hostile to the Clintons. I, that, that's modified, though, I think, overall. I just can't dismiss the gender factor. We've never, you know, a lot of people have been asking. Uh, is it a bigger deal to elect a black man as president or to elect a woman? I think it's much harder to elect a woman. I, I don't know why. Uh, other countries, you know, like Chile had an atheist woman as their leader, <coughs> and you have Israel and Great Britain and so on. Uh, in many ways, we're such a progressive country. Yet I just see over and over again this furious resistance to Hillary on, on the grounds of her gender. It doesn't get spoken of that way. It gets spoken of uh, when people attack her many vulnerabilities. She's been in public life forever. She's got a lot of vulnerability. There are a lot of things that she does that get, get me annoyed. Um, I, I should say 
uh, I know, and I think I know her pretty well, and uh, I think she's a remarkable person. Um, I, I just don't buy a lot of the dumping on her. So for me, it's pretty simple. She's a, a well-meaning person who's very interested in power, but I think power much more for the sake of public policy, uh, and yet she's hated in a way I just can't remember almost any politician being hated. The fury that comes out seems to me can only be explained by the oddness of the idea of a woman being president. Okay, I just want to remind you all, though, about the 2014 election. The Republicans surged in 2014. It seems to me there was a lot of reason to think that this was a Republican year. Um, and it seems to me that that alone points somewhat in my direction. Uh, we can't perform the experiment. A, a reputable Republican candidate against a male candidate against Biden. Right. Let's say the Democrats had nominated Biden, uh, the Republicans had nominated Kasich. Respected uh, fellow. Uh, it, it's really interesting how that would have turned out. Uh, my vibes tell me that, that, that Kasich would have won that election, that there, that there was a real kind of eight years of, of, of the Obama administration continuing deep uh, skepticism about Obamacare. Uh, some the, the, the foreign policy issue cuts a lot of different ways. A lot of the public is is, uh, is disturbed by Obama's foreign policy, which was, was more dovish than, than perhaps Hillary's, Hillary's would be. Uh, remember, you're talking from the left. And as interesting as that question is, in terms of numbers, that's not where the action I think we need to follow Let's up wait on for that. Let's wait for a microphone real quick. Thanks. That's a very important question. It's probably the most important question in the election is foreign policy. Hillary Clinton not only supported the war in Iraq, she supported the sanctions in Iraq, which uh, probably killed more people in the, uh, than the war did. She supported uh, the bombing in uh, Libya, in Yemen, uh, she, you know, the, in uh, Gaza. She supported the bombing back when she was in, in the 90s in Serbia. Uh, she supported every war that the United States has been in, going back to when she was a Goldwater girl uh, in Vietnam. And this has cost hundreds of thousands of lives, uh, in both uh, killed and wounded, destroyed communities. Uh, there's not uh, been anything comparable in the culture wars that caused the kind of harm that Hillary Clinton's par uh, foreign policies have caused. And it's not gotten the, uh, the, the amount of attention that it deserves. I mean, so if you have Christian ethics, if you believe thou shalt not kill, then the most basic types of principles, if you believe in, in uh, blessed are the peacemakers, or many of the other illusions to people that uh, are nonviolent, then how can you possibly support a mass murder and war criminal like Hillary Clinton? It's just inconceivable. Right, thank, thanks. Um, MT, do you want to start on that? Thanks, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to say I agree. I have to say I agree. And I, I have to say that I agree. Um, I mean, I, I don't know the, the details perhaps as, as you lay them out. I would want to explore them a little more. But I think that when you get a candidate who has served as um, Secretary of State, the burden that that candidate uh, bears is to answer for that nation's um, past eight years, past even longer, even if that's not while the, their term as Secretary of State, to answer for that state's foreign policy, um, uh, whether it be drawn warfare or something else. And so at, at least for um, Catholics who are um, who have a more expanded view of what um, uh, life issues are, which would include things like war, uh, and which would include things like uh, incursions in other countries that that would matter whether or not there's been a learning curve throughout the election cycle um, one would want to believe that um, but she but says one thing in public for. and another in private and she's admitted so how can you believe that it's, it's well that, that I'm agreeing sir I'm saying it's a lot to ask for of the electorate to to view a few statements and say there's been a change here just like it was a lot to ask for um, the electorate to believe that um, Bernie Sanders, for example, had changed his mind or, or had a learning curve with respect to Black Lives Matter, um, which confronted him, confronted Hillary, and confronted or tried to confront Trump and other Republican candidates. 
So this this issue of a learning curve and whether it is it can be something that has staying power through future policies. Uh, is it, can, can you talk to evidence of previous candidates who have had similar learning curve who in their policies exhibited that, or did they keep to their old ways once elected? Like that would be something to look at. I wouldn't know off the top of my head, but. George W. Bush, I think, has experienced a learning curve. His vice president, Dick Cheney, never has and never will. Okay. <laughs> Condoleezza Rice? Oh, I think you're right. I think you're right. And but she Powell. doesn't speak. Call him out, Jeffrey. Yeah. Other comments, questions? Especially from students. Yeah, big. Uh, could you go back to the the data with ethnicities and religion? Yep. So I'm, I'm just curious the extent here. here? Uh, back one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious the extent to which we see similarities between white mainline Protestants and Catholics versus Hispanic Catholics and black Protestants. And wondering, uh, the, the Protestants and Catholics seem to get along in this particular issue uh, rather remarkably. And I'm curious the extent to which this the, the religious data is mirroring racial data, and whether or not we should be looking uh, at ways that the candidates could be more convincing to either uh, ethnic or eth ethnic or ethical groups of people. So what is it that has clustered the, the Protestants and Catholics together in terms of race, and what has clustered them together in terms of ethnicity? The, the literature that I know on, on white Catholics is the, uh, the the extraordinary economic mobility of white Catholics. And so the voting is of some significant extent their pocket. I would say class has a lot more yeah. to do with yeah. this graph yeah. than than the ethnicity. So even um, this, where in the spectrum of Christianity they, they fall. I think there's only one clear and unarguable observation about religion in this election, and that's the Mormon church's hostility to Trump, which is absolutely striking. Uh, and again, I, I would attribute it uh, to Mormon theology and, and Mormons, the genuine religiosity of so many Mormons. They just will not. But, and it, it's such a contrast between the more opportunistic religious people that are <coughs> looking past Trump. Right? This church is amazing. The other religious group we haven't yet talked about is uh, uh, American Muslims. And um, uh, the, since the very beginning of this campaign, there's been a, a, a call on the Trump side to you know, halt immigration by all Muslims from abroad and then maybe from certain countries or maybe dangerous Muslims or whatever. And uh, that has uh, certainly set the, uh, the broad mainstream of both parties aflame and indignation. Um, also energized American Muslims as voters, uh, and I think that, the, as I understand it, you know, the concentration of American Muslims is a small percentage of the American population, one percent or so, maybe a touch less, uh, but they uh, have apparently uh, increased voter turnout, and they're in swing states uh, also. So you know, I wonder if you all had thoughts about uh, how the questions of Islam, Islamophobia, and simply looking for an enemy has. Uh, Served as one of the religious stories of this election. Well, watch Michigan. Watch yeah. Michigan. Because I, I don't think they're so important in that main swing state. Right. Michigan is the great concentration of Muslim Americans. Mm -hmm. If Hillary wins by a close vote, I think she will have to thank Muslim America. I would also say that uh, a defining moment <coughs> in the history of Muslim American, whatever you want to call it, uh, was the con episode during the Democratic Convention. I, I don't know how they figured out that that would just be such a defining moment. But that will be what everyone remembers years from now when Muslims are fully integrated, just another ethnic or religious group in the United States. No different than Jews, no different. It'll be that moment. Is that about uh, Islam or is that about the military? Well, I think it's about Islam. Right? Uh, we, we never actually learned much about the Khan's religiosity, so maybe I shouldn't say that. But the religiosity and the ethnicity get intertwined. They're tied up for sure. So often. Yeah. Good, thanks.
the questions, comments. Yes, David. Uh, back to which disciplines help us to understand the phenomenon that we're going through. I think uh, two in particular. One, history. And that is, we're going to have to wait 50 years and then look back. And secondly, I just think about basic anthropology. Uh, here we see prime examples of tribalism versus a more globalistic uh, counterforce and the blurring of lines. Uh, there's so much you know, tra transgender, mass migration, the movement of peoples, and various peoples. My, uh, immigration is thought about, well, the Syrians coming in, so you have that kind of Islamic movement in, into our grounds as well. Uh, matriarchy versus patriarchy. Woman, man, the strong person. The matriarchal, patriarchal. All these dynamics of anthropology just seems to be quite resonant because we see these primal forces at play. And one thing I'm just wondering is because there is this blurring of everything, blurring of boundaries, blurring of identities, blurring of philosophy, blurring of religions, of every kind of conceivable way, are we seeing, and we can speak about this in a global sense as well, as well, are we seeing kind of some of the last thrusts of the tribalistic, nativistic uh, ambitions or you know, the last screams of, of that? Because and technology and mass movements are already kind of, it's going to keep that boring going even more and more in that direction. Do we see this as kind of the swan song for some of this tribalism as a metaphor and as a, a, as an actual reality? Well, I, I see this not just an American, but a European, indeed a global challenge to manage this diversity that, or this collapsing of borders. I think that's you know just enormously important. And I do think we benefited, um, and we'll see those benefits next week from Brexit happening first. I think when Brexit happened, it like set a warning signal. Gee, votes really matter. Um, you know, but it, it, it also, I don't know, I mean, my sense is that uh, I, I can't, I'm not an expert on, on British politics. I, I can't explain why Brexit happened. But it, it was also a signal that in, I think, helping people to understand that the changes that upsets them really aren't any, under anyone's control. And that's, you know, I almost wish as just a pure experimentalist that Trump would win and people would learn he can't change anything. You know, these are, he's addressing the downside of forces that no political system can, can really take under control. So, you know, in, in that sense, um, when you're calling tribalism versus more global, it just strikes me as something that every liberal democracy is struggling with Sweden, you know, Germany. We don't know how it's going to end up. Okay, I, I agree with your last statement because it seems to me that is this the last gasp of tribalism or the, or the beginning of the unraveling of a certain understanding of globalism? I mean, Brexit was a great shock. Uh, the European, is Brexit really going to wake everybody up and get them to reinforce their love of the EU or is the EU going to break up? I think at this moment, open questions. And uh, I saw a strain of the surprising statistics. Oh, Bob Murphy is here. Bob, maybe I read this wrong, but in the New York Times, it said that for the first time since the end of the, since the early days after the World War II, global trade is down. Global trade is down. That's an astounding thing. So uh, we're in, we don't know where we're going. I, I don't. Well, certainly that sense of uh, lack of control that Alan mentioned is a dominant part of the, what's happening in the electorate today, uh, a sense of uh, uncertainty, anxiety, frustration, concern, um, and attempts to try to take some control of that uh, are at the core of what a lot of people are voting on. And it's a lot of what, and we see this in conversations around Catholic social thought as well, about, what, about the, the nature of the economy and our relationship to it, about the nature of the, the common good, what we ought to be. Uh, striving for so I, I think that there you know it's possible that this will be uh, the beginning of a longer conversation of substance around this rather than simply reactionary rage um, where um, injections of uh, deep traditional thought about uh, 
person in, in relation to society and the economy might be uh, might be actually deployed. Who knows? Uh, it's wishful thinking maybe to think that you'd have um, such a, a deeper conversation among the electorate, but surely it's out there um, now in a way. Other questions? Yes. Um, so I'm trying to gather my thoughts as I ask my question, so pardon my wording. Um, I want to go back to your idea of these non-negotiable points that particularly people who are religious identify with or feel like they have to agree on and, and vote for. Um, so as someone who is very firm and on the other side, I'm still trying to understand people in a different position of if you are religious and have these non-negotiables of you know, you're very pro-life or believe that you know, you're know like destroying the sanctity of marriage. Um, and, and you mentioned that the church um, was kind of saying that these non-negotiables are what's most important when you're voting. Are you, but, and you're, you're passing up these ideas of community and, and um, like open-mindedness. Are you saying that it would be more religiously correct to not vote than vote for Trump in this situation? Whether if you only agree on that one point that's your one non-negotiable, but the rest of, you, of his platform you just completely disagree with? Well, I know you were forming your thoughts as you were going, but I know exactly what you're asking. Um, and, and my response to that is the following. It, it, is, it might be seem like an indirect answer. Um, what I'm trying to say is that um, let me let me stick to the concreteness of, of the document of um, uh, faithful citizenship, uh, U.S. Catholic bishops, right? Uh, in which you have this set of, of um, moral absolutes and and then a set of, of values toward the common good, and the, and there is a way in which they relate, and there is also a way in the document in which they don't relate, meaning those things in political life that are considered moral absolutes are of, are of ontological consequence to the person, to the per person of faith. So they have bearing on their, the, the fate of their soul. Um, so sticking with the issue of life, abortion, choice, etc. To, to vote for a pro-choice candidate for the purpose of supporting that particular policy is considered in these documents um, a mortal sin, even if the candidate has other platforms that are considered positive for the common good. So these moral absolutes are put at a different level because they are considered to have an impact on the spiritual life of the, of the person making the, 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 doing the voting. What I'm saying with respect to the way that has failed us is that um, to the extent in which that kind of proposition is following the forces of the so-called culture wars, <coughs> they're in fact a violation of social virtues as professed by Catholic social teaching. So that in fact, this hierarchization of values itself violates um, this, this hyper, I should say, this hyper hierarchization of values in the public square hurts and injures our ability to develop social virtues. And therefore, I could be, you know, the, I would say, as a, as a if you want, in a short phrase, the culture wars. Um, are an injury to social virtues and to, and therefore to Catholic social teaching, and therefore to the development of the common good. Um, you know, one of the things that, that uh, I've been saying is, uh, for, for Christians, we are called to be Sunday people, right? Sunday people meaning the resurrection has a meaning for us, and, and we are shaped by the resurrection, and that transforms who we are um, in every realm of our lives. So we are called to be Sunday people. That, that's that, that reference. So with respect to the election, my challenge would be we are called to be Wednesday people. And what does Wednesday people mean? It means, you know, when, when, when Barack Obama was elected, first African-American president, it was momentous and historic. But that Wednesday morning, the people who were hungry the night before were still going to wake up hungry. The people who we were under the threat of being bombed 
um, because of U.S. policies, we're still going to be under the threat of being bombed because of U.S. policies on Wednesday morning. The people who were homeless on Wednesday morning, they were going to be homeless as well. Think next Wednesday morning, a week from today, it's going to be the same thing. And so how, my interest is how do I develop in the faithful the kinds of public social virtues that help them engage Wednesday morning regardless of what happens Tuesday. Now, that's not to say that the vote is not important in the sense that w whatever policies get put in place can enable or can hinder our ability to perform that. And so you were asking earlier the question about um, the Muslim vote or Muslim American uh, vote, uh, which sort of in my head got me thinking about the question of religious freedom. Um, it's a different kind of question of religious freedom, but one that has played out in this election, which is what candidate, um, which candidate's policies, if enacted, are going to enable that people of faith are able to practice their faith uh, in a freer way. In the past eight years, that has been dedicated to conversations about the Affordable Care Act and the health care mandate, um, the, the um, uh, contraceptive mandate on health care coverage, uh, as well as a few other questions regarding that, that that is a uh, violation of uh, religious freedom for those agencies that feel that their religious values go against um, contraception. But I, th I think equally we need to ask, um, are is a, our candidates' policies uh, going to allow us to contribute to the common good in the way that our tradition calls us to do so, um, by feeding the poor, by establishing schools, by establishing hospitals, by going to the border and rescuing migrants. Um, you know, those are, are equally, to me, are equally valid questions. Uh, um, so I don't want to say that the hierarchy of values is wrong to put the social virtues and the common good in one level with the, those kind of moral, non-negotiable, ontological questions on the other, but I think that they have been harmful um, and, and would like to see us go, at least in Catholic circles, to go in a different direction. Thank you. There was a hand up over here. Yeah, please. Hi. I just... Um, <laughs> I just had a question regarding something that Adam um, Stavula said, but I welcome all of your responses. You had mentioned a couple times um, the common good, and you had said that both candidates threaten the common good, and I was just wondering um, what specific ways that you see that happening, and what for you is the common good? Um, so it's like the definition of the common good is, is um, those structures, um, both governmental and other, and um, the material needs that a community needs to thrive, and for all its members to thrive, to survive, um, that needs to be protected, that needs to be contributed to, and that needs to be perhaps even augmented. Um, so, common good, schools, government, police force, roads, etc. The environment is a common good too. And to the extent that environmental safety uh, and environmental uh, protection is, a, is part of the common good, and it definitely is, both candidates' policies on, on environmental issues are a threat to the common good with respect to, to those practices. Um, they are not acting, um, they, they don't have the sort of um, short-term vision that this question demands because their time is running very uh, short. Um, La Dato Si, my pro friends, I think was very clear on, on that question of timing. Um, so the fact that these candidates do not address the, the scientific evidence on the question as rigorously as I think they should uh, is problematic. Um, that, that's one mission. I think the gentleman uh, next to you that brought up questions of foreign policy, uh, I think on both terms, you know, our relationship to the world is part of the common good. I think the questions brought up recently uh, or just now about um, 
whether we are at the edge of a new global era that's going to see different trends emerging are important. I'm not entirely sure that either candidate views it except to play on certain things. So Trump, for example, is playing off of Brexit. It's playing off of the fear of the stranger. Um, it's pr playing off of uh, insecurity of borders uh, and that, that sense uh, from people. Um, well, borders are part of the common good as well. So how do we relate to those? Um, so those are just some examples where I see that they're not really, um, they either don't have the policies in place or the, the suggestions in place to deal with um, what I feel is coming uh, environmentally, and or they have uh, talked about um, foreign policy specifically in ways that I feel are, are a threat to our relationships internationally. Either of you two want to take yeah, one, of, one of the core themes of, of uh, the common good is that the individual and the community flourish together and they cannot be separated. And so the idea that an individual can be successful or uh, wealthy without, the, without being tied to the community from which that wealth is generated is, uh, is uh, anathema to a robust conception of the common good. Uh, we work, to, to use a phrase, uh, stronger together. Um, uh, I'm not suggesting that Hillary is a, a communitarian in that in that mode exactly, but but that expresses that sort of uh, way of thinking, right? Um, and that can be controversial in a society in which uh, individualism is celebrated. Um, and uh, so I think we'll we'll continue to see lots of that. That's deeply embedded in the American psyche, uh, the idea of, of uh, together versus community versus individual. Any other questions or comments? Yes, great. Hi, thanks a lot for your words so far. Um, just to follow up on the common good a little bit, um, as someone who is trying to vote with religion and ethics in mind, can you point to ways that either candidate promotes <coughs> the common good? <laughs> I have to say, I, I, I might be skeptical. question. We have to be serious about what it is that citizens have to think about, how they have to, uh, to uh, Eric's point, that, that how, how narrow notions of individualism can be overcome for, for something broader. Uh, on, uh, on Hillary's side, I, I just find an unfortunate um, uh, kind of instinct to think that every, any serious problem that confronts people uh, there's, a, there's a national government solution for it. As I said before, I, I, I see reason for real skepticism. I mean, I'm voting for Hillary. So I, I must think that she has something of a better handle on the common good because the president, I have reluctance. I, I think the most interesting politician in America around this question is the Roman Catholic Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, Congressman Ryan. I think he's uh, evidently a devout Catholic, but his favorite author is uh, Ayn Rand. His individualism... <laughs> he doesn't say anymore. Right. I, I, not, well, I don't do <coughs> it's, it's caught on. It's learning curve. It's, it's learning curve. Right. Right. No, I think Ryan has had a little. All right. All right. <laughs> I was more or less going to say, not that this... For me, I, for me, what makes Ryan interesting is that everything I can see about every budget he proposed would harm the poor in ways that are just so antithetical uh, to uh, the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church that it just makes sense to me. But on the other hand, he will never use social Darwinist language. He, he no longer says it's Iran. He says that his policies will help the poor. I, I think almost every economist could show that you know it would take a miracle uh, uh, for something like that happen. So on the one hand, the language of the common good is violated by this prominent Catholic politician, but on the other hand, he can't escape trying to use that language because he knows how important that language is embedded in how we Americans feel about it. I, I wish I could say, yeah, I mean, I'm here, this, I wish I could say that, like an educational policy on either camp. Um, <coughs> 
NPR had a great series which was um, uh, on non-political non scientists speaking about the election. And at one point, they had um, the author of Two States with Maury, are you reminding me of his name? Oh, yes, Mitch Alum. Um, so they had him speak, and he expressed the same skepticism, and he said there's nothing about children in either, either candidate's um, a position. Uh, we cannot have a country without education. We cannot have a country without tending to our children, and neither one is giving us anything viable for our children. And that's really scary to him, and I, I really appreciate it and putting that perspective out there as a mother of four who's like, oh, okay. Um, in, in support of what you're saying, I, I just wanted to, I'm a kind of, I like to dissent from conventional wisdom. So the conventional wisdom was that Chris Wallace was the best of the debate moderators. And yeah, I'd have to say, compared to the competition, he was. But for the last debate, never have one question on climate change which is the issue. It's just absolutely astounding. And what was Chris Wallace thinking? Was all like, he had the platform. It hadn't been asked in the previous two debates. Everything about the, the emails, what's an email? You know, that, that was all, why not? So we never had one. And I agree, we never had one about children. And just to, to add uh, another great disappointment, uh, Wallace did ask a, a legitimate question about the Medicare. The Medicare Trust Fund, this is this sounds like the most boring topic on the planet, but this is a crisis. You know, we do not, we are not raising enough money to pay for this extraordinarily generous program of health care for the elderly. It is the single biggest item on the federal budget. Neither candidate was willing to face up to this crisis. Chris? I don't want to beat the, the, the drum again, but, but I of caring for one another ought to be at the center of any conception of, of the common good. And, and even the language, I mean, we, we've seen uh, a lot of strong arguments of finger pointing about who's going to be better than veterans, uh, for example, or, um, or uh, about Medicare and such. But the language really has been about um, uh, rewarding them rather than honoring our common uh, citizenship and our common lives together. And so, you know, I, I think that there. There, you see some rhetorical flourishes among the, the uh, Clinton campaign around issues of the common good, and, and perhaps depending on advisors or speechwriters or legislators going forward, that might be picked up on. But it, it's, um, it's been unsatisfying in lots of ways. I think uh, missed opportunities. Definitely. Um, we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, any others? Before we, I know you're all getting ready to watch the World Series. Oh, good. So yeah. And then Toby, and then we'll close. So uh, I thank you guys for all for your remarks. Um, kind of as, as, as a student here, um, one thing I worry about is that classroom discussions on the election are often discussed when discussing Hillary there. Until, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. Um, when discussing the election in class and in college, um, discussions of Hillary are often talked about intellectually, and discussions about Trump are often kind of the joke, the butt of the joke. People laugh about it. Um, and I feel that, or I guess, I feel like this is doing a disservice to public dis discourse about the real issues. And I guess when we equate Trump's moral, ethical grounds with all of his supporters, we're doing a disservice for future elections when this could very well happen again. So I guess my question is, is, is this, should we be taking the um, concerns of Trump supporters a little bit more seriously than we are? Uh, and by equating these kind of ethical standards. I'm glad you, you raised that because it's something I really intended to talk about. Um, in the most recent uh, U.S. Census data, the only demographic in the whole country that is showing a decline in longevity, they're living shorter lives, are white, non-college graduates in the ages of 25 and 50. This is the Trump Institute. There is a crisis in this country that we have not addressed, uh, that everything else that's bad about Trump, he has one virtue, he's raised this. Uh, the, the most deplorable moment on the Hillary side of the campaign was this dreadful remark about deplorable. Is that enough? Is that enough? America. You know, we wouldn't agree with many of them about many things, perhaps, but they're hard 
working, in many cases, God-fearing Americans, and they're not making it. And uh, nobody's addressed their concerns because, you know, they, they, they're not as badly off as the, as the worst of the poor. Uh, and their problem is that they're declining, not that they've hit rock bottom, perhaps, uh, in many ways. So both the levels of addiction, obesity, um, are, are, uh, Legitimacy are, are growing by leaps and bounds. And this, this, I think as Christians and Jews, I think we have to broaden our, our, our concerns. And, and uh, this will perhaps be the only decent thing that Trump does in this life. That was extremely well said. And I certainly agree with Toby. You asked about how we sometimes laugh at the uh, Trump people. Uh, well. Um, I can't help it. Um, <laughs> Trump has surrounded himself with so-called spokespeople who go to extreme lengths on cable television shows to defend what Trump did and uh, uh, whatever Trump is saying. And on the issue of whether or not Trump roped a woman in a first-class flight, his spokesperson, named Katerina Pearson, said he couldn't have because in first class, You've got an armrest in between. I'm, I'm one of the people on the panel, an old friend of mine named Peter Beiner, just broke out laughing hysterically. I couldn't blame him. I mean, how far do you have to go? So, so there are comical touches that I think are, are introduced by uh, Suzanne, would you like? I just wanted to return to rates again for a quick second. And I wonder how much of Trumpism you think is actually backlash against Obama. Um, I know, Alan, you said that people don't like Hillary because she's a woman. But I also wonder if people don't like Hillary because she's a white woman who was under a black man. Um, and then also, again, how anti-Semitism um, has played into this election cycle. That's another concern. One comment I would just make, uh, building off what Mark said about this discovery of these deep problems within a certain demographic. Um, the, the, what that demographic is experiencing are many of the things that they once associated only black people with, like drug addiction and children born out of wedlock and so on. And so I actually think that uh, there's much greater understanding now in the country uh, that we're not really as divided by race. That, that really, if you're living in unfortunate circumstances, it, is something that unites us. And so, you know, when Trump says that the, urban neighborhoods are a disaster and so on. I don't think that flies even among Trump supporters. Well, in that sense, uh, I think there's been a growth of that way. So the fact that uh, there's so much, um, th like the Ku Klux Klan getting publicity and so on, is, is certainly very, very disturbing. Um, but I don't believe that uh, we're actually going through uh, a total reversal on the racial progress. That Obama's election signified. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, anti-Semitism is a funny one. I don't think there's anything about Hillary that, that's supportive of anti-Semitism. And then Trump, there's, there's, you know, he had that moment where he didn't disavow that star, which um, oh, yeah. Yeah. was Sheriff's <laughs> Badge. No, it was in the shape of a Jewish star. So you, the, the, his unwillingness to disavow these dreadful races. On the other hand, Kushner is his son-in-law. Kushner is one of his favorite uh, aides. I don't actually think Trump is an among his sins. I don't think he's an anti-Semite. He just has no political judgment. He doesn't see where he just has to say, I can't accept the support of, of, of that kind of David Duke, this terrible not this Nazi. He's obtuse. He's obtuse more than he's an anti but probably not. For the younger of you, uh, there was once a uh, Jewish comedian who was quite famous named Lenny Bruce. Um, and he once said that anyone who's born in Manhattan is a Jew, uh, or anyone born in New York is a Jew whether or not they're Jewish, and anyone born outside of New York is not a Jew whether or not they're Jewish. So Trump is, <laughs> Trump is Jewish. <laughs> Alan is, but then Alan isn't, because he's been fooling me all these years. Well, I, I would like to say on the issue of race, um, you know, I, I mentioned that in my opening comments. Um, the, 
both both camps went through the summer. It was a horrendous summer with respect to um, uh, the violence, uh, police violence against African Americans, and then um, protests that became violent at where police officers uh, were killed, um, and then other subsequent levels of, of unrest, uh, racial unrest in different um, cities. They coasted over those issues, and then are very grateful that in the past month there hasn't been a flare-up. Um, but they're doing so at their own peril. And, and, and the, the fact is, um, the, the continually, uh, African Americans uh, are, are on the receiving end of a number of, of um, violations to their community, violations to their bodies, violations to their personhood, um, whether it's mass incarceration or uh, police action, um, and you know, you talk about the summation of urban communities, the summation of, of all sorts of different communities, whether it's economics or race, um, but they have coasted um, on that. And, and it, on the other side of Tuesday, who knows what, what that's going to look like. Um, but they've been lucky about this past month. Um. One word answers from you all. Will Merrick Garland be uh, uh, approved by the lame duck Congress, by the lame duck Senate? I um, had a little easy answer. One word with Tim, with Tim Kaine yeah. uh, last Friday in Boston, yeah. and I asked him that question. And his basic answer was that he would vote for him, uh -huh. certainly if it comes up. But, I, you know, I can't. I can't. No, no. I, I doubt it because the Boehner and uh, uh, sorry, McConnell has taken such a categorical position that he would, he would look uh, like a hypocrite. And he is a hypocrite, but I don't think he wants to look like I don't, I don't think there's enough time for the learning curve that is necessary right. for that to go forward. Well, um, I know all of you are getting ready to go root for the Cubs, and so uh, we want to give you time. But thank you to our panelists for a terrific conversation. And thank you all.